Today on Government Matters, for more than 60 years, the National Reconnaissance Office has worked to see it, hear it, sense it. The NRO develops, acquires, launches, and operates satellites that collect and deliver ISR, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance data, and delivers that data to warfighters and policymakers. In his first TV interview as director, Chris Galise joins me. Government Matters starts right now. From Washington, D.C. and around the world, this is Government Matters with Mimi Gerges. This is Government Matters, the only show covering the latest news trends and topics that matter to the business of government. I'm Mimi Gerges. The National Reconnaissance Office provides credible, usable intelligence, reconnaissance, and surveillance information to government agencies. Chris Galise is the director of the NRO. Chris, welcome to the program. Thank you, Mimi. Glad to be here. Last year, you marked your 60th anniversary. Tell us about NRO's history and what makes it unique. So the NRO, as you said, started about 60 years ago in 1961, and its role then and now is to provide uh, the government, military, policymakers, analysts, uh, and civil, civil agencies information from space. So we basically look at the Earth and try and understand what, what is going on. NRO's very existence was classified. Are you able to tell us when and why that was unclassified? So for 30 years, the first 30 years of, of the NRO, we, in fact, were a secret. Not many people knew who, who we were, although they often saw our launches on television uh, or in, in person. Uh, and then about 1992, it, it was determined that uh, it was time to open up and, and let people know that we existed and, and that we were providing the information that's, that's needed to understand uh, you know, the intentions of, of uh, our adversaries as well as to, to help the warfighter and the, and the first responder. But why was the existence classified in the first place? I mean, it's not a secret that you know, every government spies. Yeah, um, uh, they wanted to protect the technology and, and that's still something that we do today. Uh, we have to develop the, the latest and greatest technology so that we can stay ahead, uh, not only of what people are trying to hide or, or countries are trying to hide, but also recognizing that technology is, is improving and we have to become more efficient. We have to be good stewards of the government's money. So finding ways to be more efficient requires us to, to do things. That in and of itself doesn't require us to be secret. Uh, it's really the technology and the capabilities that we bring that we don't want others to know that we have. Tell us uh, who your customers are and how you go about fulfilling your mission. So our customers are, are really the government. Uh, principally, it's the intelligence community and, and the military. But we also support the civil sector uh, as well. Uh, in providing information because we are looking at the earth and, and, and we do look at it and we look at it, we sense it um, and, and we try and understand what's, what's going on. Uh, we provide that information to other government organizations that actually turn it into a product. So the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, National Security Agency, uh, FEMA, uh, whoever it may be. And how we accomplish that is we put satellites into orbit uh, around the Earth uh, in various different orbits depending on what needs to be sensed and how quickly they need the information. And about how many launches and how many payloads do you launch per year? That varies. Um, we, we can launch uh, you know, several a year. This year we're going to have several launches. Last year we only had two launches. Um, and each launch may carry one satellite or may carry multiple satellites. So it's hard to say what the average is, but uh, if I had to give a given number, I would say we probably average about four launches a year. So space now is a contested domain. Can you talk about the threat environment and how that has changed over time? Certainly, you had asked earlier one of the things that we do and, and one of the things that's changed from the early days in, in the 1960s and 70s is space has indeed become contested and, and to some extent it's become much more threatening. We're seeing Russia and China, uh, we've seen the ASAT tests that, that they have conducted in recent years. This is anti-satellite. Anti-satellite uh, weapons where they're launching them and they, they're destroying satellites. That clearly is, is a threat to our systems. Um, so we have to work to develop architectures that 
are not necessarily immune to that, but make those weapons less useful to them and still allow us to provide the information that's needed uh, to make decisions or to, to help the warfighter. How are you able to do that? How are you able to protect those national security assets and um, really the resiliency of those assets? So it, it comes in a number of different ways. Uh, one is by the, the architecture. We, we go off and, and, and we're saying we're using a proliferated architecture now, which is putting up multiple satellites in different orbits so that it makes it more difficult for, the, for people that want to do damage to us to pick one and do some damage. And it also allows us to have the ability to, to revisit a site more frequently so that we can collect more information to see what's going on. The other area we do is we're diversifying our uh, architecture in a way where uh, we don't just measure the same thing with every satellite, we measure different things. And that way, you can't pick one satellite and say, I'm gonna take it out. And then our partnerships. We partner with commercial. We partner with our other government agencies like the U.S. Space Force that's brand new and U.S. Space Command. Uh, and we partner with international partners. And you put all of those together uh, and that allows us to have a very resilient architecture. Well, given the importance of innovation to countering the threat and being prepared for, for the threats, you announced something called the Director's Innovation Initiative. What is that? So um, that is something that uh, we do with our uh, technology directorate, where we want to go off and explore new and interesting ideas. Um, as we talked earlier, it's very important that we stay ahead and stay current, uh, and they go together. So we want to stay current with the technology. We even want to get ahead of it, looking five to 10 years down the road. And that involves uh, trying out new technologies, giving companies and universities the opportunity to propose an idea to us that um, if it's successful, we can fly it and test it in space and then ultimately see it, it show up in an operational system. We also use it as a way to bring on new, new companies and new organizations uh, so they can understand how the NRO works and, and what our challenges are and what their opportunities to address those challenges are. Chris, you know, there's a lot of commercial satellite companies out there. Imaging cameras are getting smaller, cheaper, better. Um, how are you interacting with those commercial companies? We have a very strong interaction with those companies uh, in multiple ways. Uh, we started a few years back recognizing just what you said, that they have some incredible capabilities. Um, so we are working with those companies today. You're seeing some of the of the products of those as you read in, in what's going on in Ukraine, oftentimes where those images are, are being uh, provided. Uh, so they demonstrate the, the capability that's there. It's part of our architecture right now. At the same time, we recognize that they're also developing new capabilities. Uh, they're innovating very quickly and they're developing uh, efficient solutions. So we're trying to take advantage of that. Uh, and we have now an annual call for uh, companies to go off and propose to us what they want to go off and, and do. Uh, the current one is looking at radars. So we focus on electro-optical, basically the ones that take pictures. Uh, this year we're focusing on radar and we're seeing lots of organizations that have capabilities that we want to take advantage of and learn how they're using or in the process of developing their capabilities. And then next year we'll be looking at something different. So we want to have a regular cadence of introducing uh, new capabilities and getting ourselves introduced to new companies. You, you've said this quote, buy what we can, build what we must. How do you determine the balance between those two? Well, it's getting easier actually because the, the commercial world is, is developing lots and lots of capabilities um, that we can take advantage of. So we look at those and the evaluation process um, that I mentioned helps us determine what it is that we can really buy and then offload those activities that we would normally build um, and say, okay, we're gonna rely on you going forward in the future. Uh, and then we'll, we'll build what is not economical or really only has a, a value to the U.S. government. You know, I, I wonder what you would tell commercial companies is your biggest need right now or your highest priority? 
I would say our biggest need is reliable access to their systems. And, and we're getting it for, for the most part. And, and, and this is, you know, a problem across government, but the idea of bringing in those new companies, the startups, the small innovative companies, are you able to, you know, do that in a way that, that brings them in and maybe shortens that acquisition cycle so that, you know, they're not going out of business while they're waiting for you to write the check? Yes, and, and we work hard to try and do that. The Director's Innovation Initiative is, is one way, particularly for those companies that are really just starting out with a new idea, um, or they have a new, uh, you know, a new system that they want to try in space that that they have developed for other applications. Um, so we want to catch them very, very early and and go off and work with them so they can see what the value to us would be, and we can see uh, how we can help them deliver that value. And then at the same time, we want to go off and engage uh, with companies that have more mature products through the, the annual program where we're going to bring on commercial activities, try and test out for a year or two uh, to see how we're going, provide funding so that they can, they can uh, mature their products, and then they'll either integrate into our systems or they won't. Let's talk about international co collaboration and cooperation. You've just announced a partnership with the UK. What's that about? So um, with the United Kingdom, what we're doing is we're going to actually do our first launch uh, from uh, the United Kingdom in a, in a long time on uh, uh, a horizontal launching uh, spacecraft. It's going to launch with, from an airplane, a 747, and, and then fly out over the Atlantic. Uh, and what we want to do, though, ultimately, is, is two things. One, demonstrate the strong partnership we have and demonstrate that we have multiple launching opportunities. But the, the satellites are, are going to be uh, something that's going to be interoperable with our overall architecture. So we want to demonstrate that uh, a system developed by the UK, for the UK, can work seamlessly with, with our systems. It's an experiment to look at the, how we can seamlessly operate, and it's also adding capability to the system uh, with systems that have been developed by the UK. You know, you mentioned the U.S. Space Force is relatively new. How are you interacting with them? How are you working together with them? We work very closely with the, the Space Force. Um, they have uh, a role, obviously, in, in space, uh, largely looking uh, in things that the Air Force used to do. So you can think of, of uh, missile warning and the weather satellites, their weather satellites and, and space domain awareness. But it's more deep than that. Um, we, we try and work you know, very closely and coordinate what we do so that we don't duplicate our efforts and we maximize the value for the government. Chris, as you said, the NRO doesn't just have a national security mission. It's, there's also a civil mission as well. First, talk about how um, NRO's resources are used to help with climate change monitoring. So uh, we look at the Earth, um, and we look at the Earth in, in various wavelengths, and that gives us the opportunity to, to see what's, what's going on. Uh, we can help monitor sea level rise. We can support things like uh, natural disasters. For instance, we, we're supporting the, the rescue efforts in Haiti. While that's not, strictly speaking, only climate, it's providing information on, on what is going on. Um, and as we look at, at various areas uh, around the globe, uh, we can see how things are changing. Uh, how is land being used? Uh, what, what crops are being planted to some extent? And we provide that information uh, typically through the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency or directly to FEMA, as the case may be. But we're collecting that information all the time, 24-7, and then we distribute it, and it's used by, by others to go off and make those assessments. Let's talk about the people at NRO. Uh, you're, you have a blended workforce. What does that mean? So the NRO was created, uh, as we said, uh, 60 years ago. And the thought then was that we needed diversity of thought. Uh, they created an organization that was composed of uh, the CIA and the military, the, at that time, the Air Force and the Navy. And today, we continue that diversity. We still have the CIA there. We still have the military there. We've added a branch, of course. The Space Force is now the, 
the biggest military component, but all the, all the services participate in it. And then we have what we call a cadre, which is a direct hire in, into the NRO. Um, that gives us the diversity of thought, the diversity of people, um, and that's really what our strength is. We have an incredibly committed and, and, and uh, devoted workforce that brings uh, a lot of ideas. We have fantastic engineers and scientists and people in finance and in contracts um, that are allowing us to accomplish our mission. Well, now that you're not a covert uh, organization anymore, you can be a lot more open with your hiring. What are your biggest hiring priorities right now? So uh, hiring, it's, it's the same as everybody. Uh, I mean, we really need uh, people that are interested in space, interested in technology, interested in, in advancing the national security of, uh, of our nation, which includes, as we just talked about, climate change. I mean, climate is, is an important part uh, of what we need to understand going into the future. It's going to change a lot of things, and it's going to cause disruptions. So that plays into our national security as well. So who are we looking for? We're looking for people who are really interested in trying to be at the cutting edge of technology and trying to, to help us better understand the world. Well, speaking of people, how was the NRO impacted during the pandemic? Well, the pandemic you know, challenged us all. And of course, being uh, an organization that's, uh, that, that's focused on national security, we were limited in some of the things that, that we could do. It was very difficult for us to find uh, ways to uh, do telework, for instance, but we did find ways. And I think one of the big things that came out of the pandemic was it taught us that we could operate in different ways. We found out we had greater flexibilities than we thought that we would have before to communicate. Two years ago, three years ago, you wouldn't hear the NRO using Zoom and participating in, uh, in, uh, in conferences that way because we'd have to travel there. Now we, we can uh, participate uh, virtually. Uh, it helped us with our recruiting. Uh, before we would go out to universities and of course travel budgets are limited. Now with the ability to, to, to use you know, virtual methods, uh, whatever they may be, um, we can now go off and visit 50 or 100 universities during a year and engage with more students to, to bring them in and, and have opportunities. You know, the pandemic also highlighted the problems with the supply chain. Oh, yes. I wonder what your biggest concerns are with uh, the resiliency of the supply chain in the space industrial base. The, the pandemic certainly indicated where there are frailties in the supply chain, and it's something that we're very concerned about, and we're working with industry and with the broader government to, to focus on certain areas. Certainly, we all know about the, the microcircuit uh, concerns, but there's raw materials that we have to go off and address, and then various other things in, in various pieces of the supply chain. So we're engaging, you know, with, as I said, with industry and, and the government to go off and, and address those specific areas, as well as the, the broader area of how much do we bring on shore again, and how much do we rely on, on offshore capabilities. Chris, what are you able to tell us about how you're supporting the war effort in Ukraine and any lessons learned from watching that war? Well, there's not really much I can say uh, other than clearly we're, we're looking and listening, as, as, as we said in the beginning. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're learning a lot about uh, how quickly we can deliver information to analysts and, and, uh, and to the combatant commands. Uh, that, that are engaged in that. And we're going to take all of those uh, lessons learned and improve our systems. Uh, it's going to probably adjust our architecture and tweak things in a little, little bit, but we're learning a lot. Where's the technology going? What are you most excited about right now? I think the thing I'm most excited about right now is how we're finding ways to integrate our, our information. So artificial intelligence, machine learning, those types of things coupled with the, the new technologies that we're able to put out, uh, in space to proliferate our architectures, to increase our capabilities, is really going to help us better understand what's going on in the world and will help the analysts become far more efficient. Well, Director Scalise, so nice to talk to you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you, Mimi. Glad to be here. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.